It's May 9th, 1995, and we're at Harvard Law School with Charles Ogletree. Mr. Ogletree, why did you decide to pursue a law career? That's a, a, a very um, interesting question. There are a number of reasons. The, the first reason that I became interested in law was actually growing up as a young man in a very small community in California uh, called Merced. It's in the Central Valley of California, the area that Cesar Chavez organized in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, it's an agricultural community. Uh, and I would often see basically a white police force and a minority community. Uh, and I thought that people's rights were being trampled. And uh, I even uh, remember occasions when police came to my house to arrest my father. Uh, and I just thought in many instances it wasn't right and lawyers uh, were people who could do something different, who could make a change. Uh, the second influence came in college when I was at Stanford. I was an undergraduate at Stanford University. In my first year, uh, my freshman year, was the year that Angela Davis was arrested. Uh, and I had the opportunity to meet her because I was one of the organizers of a group called Stanford Students for Angela Davis, uh, for the defense of Angela Davis and all political prisoners. Uh, and so we were organizing, and uh, she was charged with conspiracy uh, to commit murder because weapons registered to her were used by Jonathan Jackson in the unsuccessful attempt to break out uh, some uh, inmates uh, from a case in Contra, Contra Costa County in Richmond, California. And so I um, went to the trial a lot. I didn't go every day, but I went uh, as often as I could. And I met her as well. And she had four lawyers, uh, three of them were African American, and, I, and one was Margaret Burnham, uh, who became a mentor. And I saw these criminal defense lawyers fighting vigorously for her life and valiantly for her life, challenging the government's evidence. I saw her play a role in the trial. She was able to participate with the lawyers. And although at the time I thought she would never be a, a, uh, acquitted, uh, the jury actually returned a verdict of not guilty. It was very inspiring for me to see what lawyers could do, particularly lawyers committed to representing people accused of crimes. And so it was those experiences that were primarily uh, the reason that I decided to go into law uh, and then more particularly to, to focus my career on criminal law. How would you describe your law school experience at Harvard? As a student or as a faculty member or all of the above? Uh, Harvard was uh, a very difficult experience for me in contrast to Stanford. Uh, Stanford was uh, a wonderfully open, uh, vibrant, uh, exciting place. It was called The Farm, um, which talked about its informality in the bucolic setting. Harvard was called The Law School, not a law school, or but The Law School. Uh, Stanford, you had a wide selection of courses. Uh, debate was open and vigorous and spirited. At law school, uh, there was far more structure than I ever imagined that you had assigned seats, you were assigned to a section. Uh, you had a number uh, that, uh, that you use. Uh, and instead of being able to kind of freely express your views on the wisdom of legal decisions, uh, there was a game that I later understood was a Socratic method that teachers use, often to humiliate and embarrass students, but ultimately, I guess, to build character and make them think very critically about issues in law. And so uh, it was a different experience for me. Uh, it was also different because of the timing. Uh, I was very actively politically uh, at uh, Stanford with the issues to insist on Stanford div divesting from South Africa in the 70s. Uh, issues about African liberation, about the, the removing colonial, neo-colonial governments in Africa, all of Africa. Uh, I wrote my thesis on uh, what was then Zimbabwe uh, uh, and its effort to become free in South Africa's uh, need to become free of apartheid systems. Uh, and here in Boston, I was trying to make the choice to continue that activity in, in politics on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, law was rigorous. It didn't uh, afford much time to do other things. Uh, but then I felt forced into a choice. Am I going to be a, just a lawyer or a lawyer who's going to have some commitment to struggle? And that challenge was immediate when I arrived in Cambridge because 
uh, when my wife and I arrived here, it was right in the middle of the busing crisis. And here was another issue in uh, Massachusetts uh, of race and the problems of race uh, when I arrived. And so uh, I noticed right then that it was amazing that even though we were more than 20 years past Brown versus Board of Education and the whole notion that uh, separate education was inherently unequal, um, here I saw uh, white adults, not children, but adults throwing rocks at buses with black children and rocking buses and trying to keep people out of, uh, out of communities. I saw the turmoil in South Boston. I saw a lot of black kids being taken out of places like Dorchester uh, and Roxbury, Mattapan, and being forced to go to other communities where they weren't wanted. And that was a souring experience for me here uh, as well. I think what made law school uh, most enjoyable was that I met a lot of my closest friends here, uh, that the students could see a connection between law and, and the public interest and that after my first year I was directed into things that made it much more positive and much more fulfilling that you could be uh, a law student and still have some contact uh, with the outside world. Uh, as law students we helped people in the community uh, deal with property taxes and to fill out the proper forms. Uh, we worked with the NAACP helping families to file complaints about the way they were treated during the busing crisis. We uh, conducted marches for diversity back then. The, the Supreme Court was about to hear the Alan Bakke case uh, on affirmative action, and we were very actively involved in that. So uh, it took me a while, but after the first year, I kind of hit my stride and realized that both law and a political perspective weren't necessarily mutually exclusive, uh, and they could be complementary. And it changed my whole perspective on law, and I felt less alienated, less distant, uh, and more engaged. Uh, more focused uh, and the experience became far more satisfying and I think that's why I was able in to pursue the kind of things and the career that I wanted to pursue when at first I was wondering whether that would ever happen. Where did you begin your law career after graduating from Harvard? I left Harvard uh, and, and my wife uh, and my, by then my son, my son was born uh, during my first year of law school which was a great experience um, uh, because um, he uh, kind of made me realize that there are some more important things in life than law. Um, and uh, it was also great because uh, after he was born, it also gave my wife the opportunity to pursue her, to pursue her career. We were both Stanford undergraduates. That's where I met her. Uh, and um, uh, what was great about it was that I could do what I wanted to do. I was able to go to Washington, D.C., which I had visited, and work in a city that had a great need and work as a public defender. So I joined the D.C. Public Defender's Service, which was then viewed as the, an exemplary project, one of the best public defenders in the country, because they had uh, extensive training program, they had caseloads, so lawyers could, would only handle the amount of cases they could handle effectively. They had investigators to help them with their cases, they had social workers to help them prepare plans for their clients, and there was an esprit de corps there that really made the place special. And so it was a wonderful job, and it was a wonderful opportunity to get great uh, experience, great training, to be around brilliant lawyers, and to represent uh, members of the community who often uh, did not have uh, effective representation. So to me, it was a wonderful opportunity. What were some of your more memorable experiences at the Public Defender's Office? Well, uh, they, they, they were pretty widespread. Um, I represent some great clients. Um, uh, I represent some bad people who did bad things. Uh, I learned a lot from some great lawyers, and I had some great cases. And uh, the best part was that the Public Defender Service really was a true family affair. We spent most of our time together, not just in court, but out of court. Uh, our families would share time together. Uh, we had uh, co-ed softball teams. Uh, I coached the women's softball team uh, as well. Uh, we spent nights working on cases, but also we'd go to dinner together. Uh, and there really was a sense of community. And I think it was so important because so few people understood what it meant to be a public defender and how we could represent people charged with serious crimes. Uh, and so it was a rewarding experience. And I had 
uh, clients uh, who committed very difficult and, and, and vicious crimes who were acquitted uh, by juries and they would go out and commit other crimes and I'd represent them again. Um, I had uh, clients uh, who I helped turn around uh, from lives of criminality, usually my younger clients, juvenile offenders, who I felt not only was it my duty to represent them, but I should be responsible for aftercare to make sure that once they left the system, they would not come back, and I tried to do that as often as I could. I also um, represented clients who didn't trust me. Um, I remember one particular client uh, who was uh, a, a white gay man who was quite upset that he had a black lawyer representing him. Um, and uh, he thought that uh, he would have no chance uh, because the, the judge had appointed a black lawyer. And he was charged with a homicide. And um, uh, I was able to get uh, him acquitted in the, in the uh, trial, even though he made very disparaging comments about me during the uh, process of representing him. And I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him after that. And it was very helpful for him to understand that he shouldn't judge people uh, by their race uh, and for him to understand that uh, that particularly lawyers at that agency were committed to clients uh, without regard to the client's views or attitudes or expectations. We just wanted to do a good job for everybody. Uh, I also represented uh, a number of women who had a host of difficulties that weren't being addressed by the system. Uh, charged with a woman who had been battered, uh, a woman who had been abused, uh, and to get juries, even at that time in the late 70s and early 80s, to understand the battered woman syndrome um, and other aspects of the subordination of women before it was popular, uh, popular uh, both in terms of literature and in terms of legal system. Um, and so the greatest part of the job was representing the clients and giving them a sense that even though they could not afford their own lawyer, even though they did not choose their own lawyer, even though the evidence against them was often overwhelming, that they went into the courtroom and they felt, my goodness, here is somebody who completely and unequivocally cares about me and will do everything that they can to represent my best interests. And to do that, we did it vigorously, zealously, forcefully, within the bounds of the law. We didn't, we didn't uh, hedge on ethics. We didn't draw the line close because we knew that if anybody in the system was going to be checked, it's going to be defense lawyers. And so we spent more time than any group of lawyers talking about ethical issues and ethical dilemmas. How do you handle evidence? How do you go about investigating the, uh, a case? How do you deal with a hostile witness? How do you approach a prosecutor who may not turn over material? How do you deal with the judge's apparent and in some cases real hostility, racial, uh, gender, sexual orientation, religious, whatever the hostility might be? How do you protect your client's interests uh, with the judge? I mean, all those were things that we had to, had to address uh, and we did it very effectively uh, at the Public Defender Service and it turned out to be quite uh, a valuable experience. How did this experience affect the rest of your career? Well, it made the rest of my career, in the sense that uh, it's the best job I ever had. Um, I went on to private practice. I represented a range of incredibly interesting clients. But that was the job that made me understand what it meant to be a lawyer fully committed to a client. And there is no substitute for that kind of experience. Uh, the lessons were pretty broad, I understood what it meant to be ethical and that uh, you're, you're only as good as your reputation. I understood what it meant to engage in what we call client-centered representation, that clients' interests are foremost and that lawyers may think they're brilliant uh, and crafty uh, and thoughtful and wise, but clients ultimately have the power to decide and make crucial decisions in the cases. I understood what it meant to be a sought-after defender. That means both the clients wanted me to represent them and that prosecutors didn't like the fact that I had a lot of success in my trials and wanted to challenge Tree. They wanted to try a case against Charles Ogletree. And sometimes I wondered whether that was against my client's best interest because some cases should have had uh, plea bargains uh, or should have had uh, better results. And I remember one case where I represented a client and he was acquitted in one set of charges 
He had another set of minor charges, and I wanted to plead it out, and the prosecutor refused to offer us a plea, saying that my client should not have been acquitted of the first charge, and he wanted to win the second one and tell the judge. Well, we took him to trial, and we won the second charge as well. And I thought that was kind of unfair. I'm glad it worked out, but it was kind of unfair for the prosecutor to kind of go after the client in that kind of way. And you begin to understand that your role as your client's advocate takes on implications broader than the individual case, that sometimes egos uh, get involved in the work. Um, I also understood that it's not for everybody, that there are aspects of the work that uh, make it pretty uh, clear that you have to have a certain disposition. And you have to be able to really, truly empathize with clients and respect the client's case to listen to be an active and careful listener, which is a skill that many lawyers don't have. Lawyers are so used to making decisions and having ideas that they don't listen to understand clients. Uh, you also have to understand uh, that there are a lot of reasons to do the work. Some is that, the, that it's an adversarial system. That's a straightforward reason both sides should be represented. Others is that it's the state uh, charging your client. and, and that the, the state can't take away people's rights without a vigorous defense uh, for those who are accused. Others was that um, the police often made mistakes um, in the way they obtain evidence or the way they obtain confessions, and that uh, the police practices alone uh, were grounds to challenge uh, the, the conduct. Other times uh, it was simply uh, the, the fact that uh, in our system, uh, sometimes there is no clear evidence of guilt or innocence. Uh, a person may have committed offense, but they may have acted in self-defense. Uh, they may have acted in defense of another. They may have been suffering from a mental disease or def defect that caused them to act. So there's a whole host of reasons. And if you are not prepared to accept and buy into those reasons, uh, criminal defense work is not for you. And so when I teach my students today, I tell them it's an important work, it has to be done, and uh, you may not be the one to do it, but you have to agree that someone has to do it. People deserve the right to be represented, and only by people who are going to vigorously defend them and defend them uh, without compromise. And so those are the lessons that I've learned and that I try to pass on to other people who may be interested uh, in doing defense work. Do you feel the criminal justice system as a whole is effective, or are there still areas that need improvement? It is a system that needs substantial improvement. It needs improvement both in perception and reality. The perception among a lot of people of color and people who are poor is that there are two forms of justice. One form of justice for those who are rich and one form for those who are poor. It's because they see people who have money uh, in some sense uh, use it to manipulate the system. They also see that, uh, interestingly enough, the people who are charged with the most serious offenses uh, and who face the greatest penalty, that is death, uh, are invariably poor uh, and substantially uh, minorities. And there are no wealthy people on death row. And so when you don't see that distribution in terms of who commits crimes and who's punished, uh, it, it gives a perception that the system's unfair. And the reality that there's some disparity in the system as well, when you see now in our criminal justice system that 50 percent of the people who are in jails and prisons in this country are black men. Uh, when we, we as a group, as a race, represent only 12 percent of the population. There's something wrong with the system that has numbers skewed that much. Uh, the reality is that it starts with suspicion. People are sus suspected in many cases because of their race. And then once you have this unfettered dis suspicion, then you have arrest and then you have uh, prosecutions, and you have convictions, and you have sentences, and the numbers just multiply. Uh, and you, you can't tell me that you don't have problems of drug sales in Brookline or Newton or other places, but the concentration of police power is in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. And so you have a whole generation of young people, particularly young black males, growing up distrusting the police, and the police distrusting them. So if uh, a group of kids are gathered on the street corner and the police come, they'll run, whether they did anything or, uh, wrong or not. And the police will chase. 
and they might find somebody who did something. If they find one person or two who did something wrong, the assumption is that all eight were doing something wrong. So the police say, we can always stop when they run, there's guilt. The kids will say, whenever the police come, they're going to chase us. And so there's this, this problem in the system. Uh, and, it, and then it, w people walk into a courtroom, and they rarely see uh, black lawyers who are prosecutors or black judges uh, or black defense lawyers or black jurors. So the sense is that, my goodness, how can I get any justice if the people who are judging me are not from my community? And so that's, that feeds into the perception that the system and the criminal justice system is wrong. And that's why a lot of what I write about and speak about is to address these disparities in the system and with the idea that at some point in some way people will try to resolve some of these disparities, eliminate some of these disparities, so that our system will be perceived and in fact be a fairer system. Uh, there, there are also other problems of resources. If you look at the people who are tried, uh, a lot of the people, if you go to um, the uh, National Street Jail, you'll see substantial population of minorities. Almost all those people are there with court-appointed lawyers who are paid by the state. They can't afford their own lawyer, so they can't afford the opportunity to do the things that they want to do. The lawyers don't have unlimited resources. They can't do everything they want to do. They can't fully investigate every case. They can't uh, have experts in every case. There's a lot of judicial approval that's necessary before they can do certain things. As a result of that, there is a perception that the system, and particularly the criminal justice system, is unfair. And my sense is that if the person who arrests you, and then the person who charges you, and then the person who tries you, and then the person who represents you, and then the person who judges you uh, is not from your community, by and large, you begin to say, how can I believe the system's going to be fair? And we have to start changing that perception and changing the reality. I'm not saying that prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, jurors, and judges have to be predisposed to uh, support defense uh, claims by defendants, but at least there have to be a sense that when I walk into there, it's fair, so that I can accept the punishment, I can accept the sanction, I can accept the judgment if I feel it's being imposed by the community from which I come. And when we don't have those things there, it, it feeds into the problem. It's also a problem that, that our entire system uh, creates, uh, and if you think about it, uh, I recently went on the tour of the Nashua Street Jail with the Reverend Jesse Jackson and a few other officials. There was a stark contrast between the Nashua Street Jail and the Jeremiah Burke School. The Jeremiah Burke School is close to being decertified because of the conditions there, the physical conditions, the curriculum, the educational opportunity. The school's falling apart, broken lights, uh, plaster moot missing from the walls, uh, broken glass, uh, poor ventilation, uh, a health hazard. And it's a public school where children have to go every day. You go to the National Street Jail, high-tech uh, facility, 24-hour supervision, 24-hour medical care, lights, heats, meals, television, computers, educational system. Uh, and isn't it ironic that when a person commits a crime, they have access to the best uh, supervision, the best technology, the best automation in our system. But when they're trying to get an education, they have the worst supervision, the worst technology, the worst automation. Uh, and we have our, 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 our priorities wrong. And so when we talk to young people in the criminal justice system, I'm not surprised that they have no faith in the system because they see what happens at the Jeremiah Burke School and then what happens in Nashville Street Jail and say there's something wrong with this picture. And so it feeds into the distrust of the system. And then they can't find a job if they want to. Kids who want to work can't find a job. People say, work at McDonald's. McDonald's doesn't have an endless list of jobs. And kids want to work at McDonald's, but you know, they're looking for jobs. Or they say, you know, fill out a resume. Or finish your high school diploma. And I think it's, it's absurd for us to tell kids that a high school diploma is going to get them a meaningful job. It just isn't happening anymore. People can't find good jobs with college degrees. And so all of this perception feeds into reality and feeds into a sense that the system is wrong. And then the worst part of it is that we dump all of our systemic problems in the criminal justice system. The people who are in the criminal justice system 
who aren't simply people who, who commit crimes, but they're undereducated, they're un undernourished, uh, they have health care problems, uh, they're unemployed, uh, and so the whole host of our societal problems get dumped in the criminal justice system and we don't have the resources, uh, we don't have the commitment, uh, we don't have the creativity to solve those problems. So there are some problems in the criminal justice system uh, that are being overlooked and in some sense exacerbated because we haven't addressed them early on in other aspects of the system. Why did you leave the public defender's office? Well, I was fired. Um, I had a great job at the public defender service and uh, had a great run there. Uh, I worked there uh, in, from juvenile to adult cases, uh, handled appeals as well. Uh, I was appointed the uh, training director, which was one of the major uh, staff appointments, and then I was appointed the chief of the trial division, which is the next highest position, and then deputy director, and then came in line to become the director of the agency. And when I was a deputy director, there was a lot of pressure on my boss, who was the director, uh, to, in a sense, uh, modify our litigation stance against the city because we had some concerns with the way uh, the city ran the juvenile justice facility. And my boss and I got into trouble because we made a decision that was, we thought was in our client's best interest. It was in our client's best interest. We represented juveniles. When I was the training director, we went to a juvenile facility. Uh, it was in October and the heat wasn't on. The rooms were freezing. The kids didn't have blankets. Uh, there were mice all over the facility. There were roaches. Uh, it was despicable because those were not conditions for anyone to have to live in. And we wanted to sue to make the conditions constitutional. The Board of Trustees uh, of our agency uh, was uh, uh, consisted of people who had been appointed by the mayor of our city and by the, the judges, the chief judges. And we wanted to sue, and we were told in no uncertain terms that if we were suing to improve the conditions of the Children's Center, as it was called, uh, and of the, the two facilities, Oak Hill and Cedar Knoll, we were in effect suing the mayor. And that was a politically unpopular thing to do. The mayor at that time was uh, Marion Barry. Uh, and to, to us, it wasn't a difficult question. You know, we understand it's the mayor, but the conditions are unconstitutional and we're going to sue. And I was one of the original parties, along with my boss, who brought suit against the city. Um, and we were also being told by various people who we should hire at the agency. We should hire people who simply had a resume, as opposed to people who were committed to being zealous public defenders. Uh, and because of that, uh, my boss uh, was forced to resign. Uh, and I was still the deputy director and applied for the director and someone else was appointed, but then I was asked to step down, and I did. And it was a very painful decision because I really loved that job and really loved doing the work, even though there were a lot of other things I could do, a lot of other money I could have made. But it was a sense of principle in terms of if the agency was not going to do what I thought it should do, that didn't make much sense for me to stay there. And uh, almost all the attorneys there in sympathy for my plight wanted to resign and I really insisted that they, they not do that, that the clients and the agency was far more important than any individual. Uh, and uh, although they initially disagreed with me, they ultimately saw that, that, that I said put your energies into the clients and into the agency and to show the people who are trying to destroy it that we can survive beyond them. And they did. And in fact, the irony of the situation is that the same people who criticized the Board of Trustees when I was there and who supported me are now on the Board of Trustees. It's been completely revamped. The chair of the Board of Trustees and the last three directors of the agency were all people who joined me in protest against what was happening in the 1980s. And the agency is as successful. Uh, they're still getting the top lawyers in the country. They still have an incredible record of success in, in uh, the, doing things for the city. And so it still is an exemplary agency. And so although I uh, would have loved to stay there and, and do the work that was so important to me, I'm very, very happy that, that it has turned out to be a wonderful place. And, and now all of us who are alumni are still supporting its work in a variety of different ways. And it was a very important challenge for me to be able to, 
to see beyond that. And now I, I write about it, I support the alumni organization, I participate in training program for new lawyers, and I keep trying to tell them, no, my feet are on the ground. I am not uh, this magical, mystical icon. I'm just a lawyer just like you, and you too can make a difference. So it's wonderful to go back and be honored at the same agency that uh, uh, not too long ago uh, went through some difficult times uh, because of the, the politics of the city uh, that should not have been the politics of the agency. After leaving the public defender's office, where did you go? I went to work for uh, a wonderful law firm, uh, a minority-owned law firm. It was uh, just me, Fort Noble Tree. I was one of the name partners. It was a general practice firm. Uh, my two other name partners, Ron Jessamy and Joanne Fort, had been partners in the largest minority firm in the country, uh, Hudson Leftwich and Davenport. And the firm broke up in the early 80s, and they formed their own, formed their own firm and asked me to join them. And so I did some appellate work, some criminal work, and some journal litigation um, as a partner there. Um, and. Um, uh, did a lot to, to working with the young lawyers there, trying to train them in litigation because that was one of the things that we wanted to do. Um, and then at the same time, I had been offered a job to come teach at Harvard um, from Dean Bornberg, Jim Bornberg, and I resisted at first. I didn't want to come back to Harvard, and I really wanted to stay in Washington. Uh, he then wisely not only approached me but approached my wife and kids and told them what a wonderful place it would be to come to Cambridge. and. Um, they thought it was interesting. My kids thought it would be nice to live somewhere else for a while. My wife was interested in going on to graduate school. And, and I decided to come up reluctantly uh, as a visitor uh, from practice, but not to make a commitment to stay. And so I came up and um, um, thought it was interesting, enjoyed my teaching experience, had a great time. And my family loved it. My daughter loved it. She started in first grade in her first year. The teacher thought she was so wonderful, promoted her to third grade. So she never wanted to leave Massachusetts. She said, hey, you know, I'm a star here. My son was doing very well. He was active in sports and, and they both were good students. My wife was going to graduate school and getting her master's in business administration. And so they were, they were a happy group, but I was still unsure that I wanted to be at Harvard on a permanent basis. And we thought about it and looked at all the options and thought about going back out to California, uh, where we both uh, had gone to school, thought about going back to Washington, and ultimately uh, decided to stay here because Jean, Dean Bornberg made uh, an, an offer that was uh, too hard to refuse. The offer was that I could stay here and create a criminal justice program uh, that Harvard did not have, and that students would be able to uh, do research and practice. Um, uh, on criminal justice issues uh, through what was called the Criminal Justice Institute. So Dean Vorenberg basically let me create my own program and it seemed like a wonderful opportunity and that's why uh, I left Washington and came to Harvard. Uh, unfortunately, once I decided to stay uh, to start building this program, uh, Jim Vorenberg resigned as dean. I said, oh my God, you know, the guy gets me here, all this, these well wishes and then he's gone, you know, he decides to step down. And so I thought everything was uh, at risk of, of disappearing. And so I, uh, the new dean was Robert Clark, uh, who was not as sympathetic to clinical education. Uh, at least he wanted to examine it, to re-examine it, to decide whether or not it, it deserved the huge budget that Harvard committed to it on an annual basis. And I had three meetings with him as the new dean before I decided I was going to stay, and he convinced me that he was going to have an open mind about uh, my program and about clinical education. Uh, and as it turns out, he's had an incredibly open mind about clinical education. He has supported the program in unprecedented numbers in terms of the, the size of the staff and the size of the budget. Uh, and although he was not as uh, generous, in fact, as Jim Vorenberg had been in theory about the size of my program, he has continued to support the growth of my program over the years. And that has been encouraging. And I've been very happy about that. Uh, and he supported other aspects of my program, including major conferences on criminal justice issues, supporting our, uh, our national criminal trial advocacy team. Harvard's team has won first place and second place in the four years it's been in the competition. 
and he supported my research and other projects within and outside the school. And, and he's also uh, winds me up and sends me out to talk to alumni groups around the country and around the, 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 the world uh, to boast about the school and things that I do. So that's turned out to be a very good, uh, good prospect, uh, project. And that is uh, the principal reason. Vorm Burke asked me to come back. Gary Bello, who also had been a public defender in D.C., wanted me to take over the criminal clinical program because he had been running the civil for a couple of decades. Um, and a number of my former professors who also were excited to have me back. So that brought us back to Cambridge uh, and with a focus, uh, and that's what I've been doing. What, was, what were the arguments against the clinical program that you were trying to start? And why did you feel it was so important? The arguments against it were predictable arguments as expensive, which it is, because uh, clinical education is expensive in the sense that instead of having a classroom of 150 students and one lecture, one teacher lecturing and saying, learn the law, you have 20 students and three or four uh, supervisors who take the students and examine issues uh, and examine it again and reflect on it uh, and extrapolate from those examinations and to get into the nuances of, of problems. Uh, you look at ethical issues and you turn them inside out. You make students much more reflective. You have supervision whenever they are in court. You have them writing journals and you give feedback. Uh, in most law school classes, the professor's only feedback the, the, to a student is on an exam. And even then, it's a random comment. It's not a detailed response. In clinical education, it's really uh, labor intensive, which means that you spend a lot of time answering questions, asking questions, giving written feedback, going to court. And, and I think people thought that that was too intensive. It also is, uh, it works on skills and on the part of practice. And here there's a lot of focus on theory but not on practice. Very few of the professors here, or at most law schools, uh, have actually practiced law on a sustained basis or gone into a courtroom to argue a case. So it takes on a different set of skills. Uh, in a different level of imagination, in a different level of intensity uh, than uh, the normal lecturing uh, involves. And so, but the point is that if we're going to talk to students about being professionally responsible uh, and uh, being well prepared, there's nothing better than actual experience. Uh, and uh, that has been said not only by, you know, the great Oliver Wendell Holmes and other great thinkers, uh, but by uh, uh, people um, as d d diverse of, as Erwin Griswold, one of our esteemed deans, and uh, Justice William Brennan, uh, and Thurgood Marshall, who contributed so much to the Supreme Court, not just through the power of his intellect, but through the power of his experience, having been an African American uh, who spent time in the courtrooms handling death penalty cases, fighting civil rights issues. And he could tell the real stories that put law in context in the Supreme Court that made other judges think twice uh, before they made rulings. And so that was what I wanted to bring, and that is what was missing. And those were the arguments, uh, and they have been c c compelling. And in fact, a significant number of my colleagues who had never, ever done any uh, practice started doing more clinical education. In fact, people like Bruce Hay. Uh, and Duncan Kennedy, uh, and Chris Edley, uh, and Martha Minow, uh, uh have started teaching courses with a clinical uh, perspective uh, so that they can make sure that students can not only learn environmental law or labor law or family law uh, or uh, you know, some other public interest law, but they can understand the practice relationship uh, to law. And so it's been an eye-opening experience for a host of people, and it's been very, very valuable. Uh, and, and they have become uh, strong supporters of it as well. What do you feel is the most important lesson law students should learn? I think the most important lesson that law students have to learn um, is that law can be a powerful tool um, and that they have to handle that power responsibly. Uh, they can do a lot of good and they can do a lot of harm. 
So they have to take the awesome power of law and to use it in a responsible fashion. So when they learn law and when they study law, they have to appreciate uh, a fundamental principle that it's not simply about rights. There are a lot of rights that we have. You have the right to do this, the right to do that. We have a very, very generous bill of rights that gives people freedom of speech and religion and association, uh, the right to travel, uh, the privilege against self-incrimination, uh, the privilege of, of unlawful searches and seizures, uh, uh, the protection against cruel and unusual punishment and things like that. But we also have to understand that there is a right and there is a necessity to do the right thing in the context of law. To know the distinction between having the right to do something and doing the right thing. And so it is to take the awesome power of law and to handle it in a responsible fashion uh, that is the lesson that I always leave with my students. Um, and if they can balance the right to do something with doing the right thing, I think that they will be ethical, thoughtful, reflective, and responsible members of the profession. Uh, and that is the ultimate lesson that I try to teach. Why did Professor Derek Bell take a leave of absence from Harvard Law School, and what was your involvement in that situation? Der Derek Bell is a, a man of great conscience. He's always been that way. When I was a student here, I admired his commitment uh, to all students, uh, and particularly the time he spent work with minority students. Uh, Derek Bell came to Harvard in 1969 with the expectation and understanding that he was not going to be the only but the first of many people of color who would be here. And what people don't know is that he has consistently challenged Harvard Law School and Harvard University to diversify because he did not see a distinction between diversity and excellence, that you could be excellent with diversity and you were not at all diluting your excellence because of diversity. And so he's always pushed for more. In fact, he left Harvard in 1990, 1981 originally because it was his judgment the school had not done enough to bring in people of color and he became dean of Oregon Law School. Oregon Law School did not uh, do well in di uh, appointing diverse faculty, and he resigned there under protest because he felt that they sh should do more. When Claire Dalton encountered the strong opposition here uh, at Harvard from some of the faculty, uh, uh, Derek Bell was the only faculty member who publicly protested her denial of tenure. He had a fast in his office uh, and refused to participate. He, it was his symbolic way of saying what you did with Claire Dalton was unfair, it was politically motivated and unjustified because she is clearly as much of a scholar as other people uh, who had been uh, appointed during the same time frame who happened to be white and male. And um, he also raised the same issues in the uh, early 90s saying that he wanted women of color and that there was no reason that Harvard by 1990 did not have a woman of color and that he was not going to stay here if they did not have one. So he resigned under protest, saying, I'm not going to come back until you make an appointment. And in a sense, you're forcing me out. I'm not leaving voluntarily. I'm leaving involuntarily. I'm, I'm committed to diversifying the faculty. And I strongly agreed with Derek that Harvard should have a diverse faculty and that there were women of color who should be appointed, uh, very skillful, very competent, very scholarly, uh, who should be here. And even though I did not have tenure at the time and was in the early stages of building the Criminal Justice Institute, uh, I talked to my wife and talked to Derek and his wife, Jewel Bell, and told him that I supported him and that uh, Pam and I had thought about it and, and I was prepared to resign as well to leave Harvard and go back to Washington to practice uh, to support his protest. Uh, and he talked about with Jewel and, and they urged me not to leave, said you don't have tenure. Uh, you could, should continue to work. I can afford to do it. I have tenure. Uh, I can move on. You should stay here and make and, and keep the pressure on inside as I did. And with your, my outside pressure and your inside pressure, eventually we will prevail. Uh, and with great reluctance, I, I accepted uh, his advice and have continued to try to push from within and try to encourage my colleagues to see the value of diversity. And I think, uh, albeit slowly, that there is a, a certain momentum moving in the direction uh, of um, appointing uh, not a woman of color, but women of color. And, and I am, am confident that it will happen 
uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, people will say it had nothing to do with Derek Bale, it had nothing to do with protest, and, and maybe in a sense that might be true because the people who are going to be appointed are people who are magnificent and wonderful in, in their own right, but I doubt that their cases would have had the attention or would have been brought to the forefront or the action would have been taken as quickly but for the fact that uh, Derek made it an issue uh, and has it constantly on our minds uh, and we are uh, ever mindful of the needs uh, to move forward and to make some, some judgments. So um, uh, he, he is, I just saw him this uh, past weekend, uh, he was here for another matter and, and uh, you know we're the closest of friends, he's still my mentor, uh, he's still a role model uh, and I still think very fondly uh, on the fact that he could make the sacrifice to give up a, a lifetime tenure at Harvard Law School. And he doesn't have tenure anywhere. I mean, it's not like he's going on with the tenured uh, profession, but he's a man of principle and a man of conscience. And uh, although I don't always agree with him on every issue, and he certainly doesn't always agree with me on every issue, uh, I admire his commitment, his focus, and his vigilance. And, and I do think that uh, it, it's an example that people can learn from. If you're really committed, you can take some steps that, that will demonstrate that commitment, even if it means some level of personal sacrifice. Back for a moment. Uh, what led to your serving as counsel to Anita Hill during the Senate confirmation hearings for Justice Clarence Thomas? Well, it was very interesting, and the timing is interesting. Derek left in 90, uh, and his. Um, uh, kind of expulsion became uh, final in 91. In 91 I was given a research leave because I was coming up for a tenure in 93. And when I was on research leave, um, uh, working on an article that was going to be part of my tenure file, I got a call uh, from two black women who I knew professionally and who were friends of Professor Anita Hill. And they asked me to help. And I tried to be of some help from a distance. Uh, and without going into the entire elaborate story, uh, they basically asked me to, to be of assistance to her during these, the, these confirmation hearings. And I told them I can't be too directly involved because I'm coming up for tenure and I don't have the time. And I need to, I'm on research leave. Uh, I agree, since Professor Hill did not have a lawyer uh, and seemed to be in a very precarious position, to serve as an advisor, and I made, uh, advised her during the early process. As a result of that, she asked me to get more involved, and I agreed to go down to Washington to help her with her legal team and to help her prepare for these hearings. And my role was going to be in the background. In fact, I didn't even plan to stay in Washington. I was just going to help prepare her. Apparently, she was impressed with my efforts to help prepare her. and. Early, much too early, the morning before the hearing, at 5 o'clock in the morning, she called me and we had a long conversation, very, very long conversation. And she basically said, well, will you stay and represent me? And I said, well, you've got other lawyers, you know, you're prepared. She said, but I want you here. And I was reluctant uh, and um, was kind of equivocal about what I would do. Um, and then two other people approached me, uh, Professor Emma Coleman Jordan and Professor uh, Susan um, Beck from uh, Georgetown. Uh, and uh, they, uh, Susan Della Ross, I'm sorry, uh, from Georgetown, they approached me uh, because they too thought it was important to have me involved in the case. And what I recognized and what troubled me the most about the case is that Although people were coming to Professor Hill's support, I did not see African-American men coming to her support. And people were being silent or equivocal or supportive of Justice Thomas. And I thought that was odd that here's an uh, educated, thoughtful, respected, reflective black woman making a very serious claim and no one wanted to give it serious attention. And all of our quote, political leaders and civil rights leaders weren't standing up. And I thought it was important for an African-American man to say Professor Hill deserves a hearing. Uh, she deserves to have an opportunity to give her uh, story and to have it examined in a public way. Uh, and it's amazing to me because I know that if this, if Professor Hill had been white, 
that there's no question that people would have run to her aid and, and offered her support. I have no doubt in my mind. And that to me was an important step because I felt very strongly about it that I couldn't just stand on the sidelines, so I agreed to do it uh, and uh, represented her. And, and tried to protect her throughout the hearings and tried to advise her and basically took on the role as uh, lead, her lead counsel and had to make the hard decisions, for example, the decisions for her to take the polygraph test, which uh, ultimately turned out to be the turning point in the case. When, when the senators on the other side, uh, from the Republican side, were attacking her, her character and her credibility and her sanity and her sexual issues, um, it became clear to me that it was not lo no longer a fact-finding hearing, but uh, almost uh, a McCarthy-type hearing where she was becoming the defendant in a trial uh, and being attacked when the question was whether or not Justice Clarence Thomas was suitable for the Supreme Court. And because of that, we agreed to take the polygraph test and agreed to use the government's leading expert on the test, Paul Miner, and which and, and we knew that. We could not get the, the Democratic senators to ask Justice Thomas a hard questions or to focus on his character, and that the Republicans were using all kinds of hearsay and rank hearsay uh, and just completely untrue uh, claims against Professor Hill. It didn't matter the answer, they would just ask outrageous questions, claiming that this theme had come from the exorcist or that uh, the ideas had come from cases, just totally absurd without challenge from the Democrats, that uh, we had to, in a sense, save her reputation in a public way. Uh, and we did that, and when she passed the polygraph test, we had not announced it publicly. And that's when, uh, as my little, my, my little clipping back there says, Senator Orrin Hatch became furious and said, well, that's exactly what a, a two-bit slick lawyer would do. That's exactly what we did, and that's what I did, and I take full responsibility and credit for it because I was going to defend her to the end, and we did it. And although it was interesting that in 1991 the polls had the public supporting Clarence Thomas over Anita Hill in 1991, the polls have changed dramatically since then. And uh, a year later, uh, there was a series of articles, including one in the U.S. News and World Report, saying that on reflection and after looking at the record and all the evidence, people then supported Anita Hill substantially more than Clarence Thomas. And the gap has continued to grow and, and those who are supporting her and opposing him because he turned out to be the ideologue that, that we thought. And uh, the book that was written called um, um, uh, 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 Strange Justice, The Selling of Clarence Thomas is the first authoritative, legitimate, investigative reporting on the case uh, corroborated her version and, and showed the mounds of contradictions in his version. Uh, and in a sense, uh, the p even conservative people who supported him uh, says he's turned out to be worse than he was. And now people wish uh, Angela Wright had testified, and we wish she testified. And all this other evidence that could have been produced if we didn't have to do it. The other interesting thing is that this hearing took place over three days, and people look back at it and feel like it took up forever because it was such a historic event. And I think that because it was so truncated, people didn't examine all the evidence then, and now people have had a chance to reflect on it. It's a very different point of view. But there are some good things in, in, in that case that people ignored. As much as it was uh, disappointing to see two educated, thoughtful, articulate African Americans being in this major national and international confrontation. What you also saw, I think, for the first time, and hopefully not the last time, was a group of articulate, distinguished, well-educated, uh, confident African-American men and women on both sides of the aisle testifying for both, representing both. And you don't see that on television. You don't see that in the public discourse. Uh, you see caricatures. Uh, you see celebrities. You see athletes. But you don't see intellectuals. You don't see scholars. Uh, you don't see teachers. And so people saw more African Americans who were academics and who were professionals during the course of that three weeks than they've probably seen uh, ever in, in one time. So that's a lesson in terms of all these Harvard-educated, Yale-educated, Stanford-educated, Georgetown-educated, Howard-educated, Chicago-educated, UCLA-educated, uh, Pennsylvania-educated men and women 
uh, in a sense, gave America a little glimpse on the greatness uh, of, of uh, African Americans in, in the legal profession and in business. And that was one of the major benefits of the, the hearings that, uh, to me, was one of the positive aspects of having gone through that. And also to develop uh, a friendship with a person like Professor Hill, who I uh, uh, respect uh, uh, a great deal because she's continued to be focused on those principles and has shared her story uh, with other women. And we both receive many, many letters. She received over 50,000 in the same year from women who had the same plight and who were saying, I too went through what you went through and I haven't told my boyfriend, husband, father. And it's been 20 years or 50 years. And in a sense that it, it forced Congress to change. Uh, Carol Mosley Brown would not be in Congress. Barbara Boxer um, would not be a member of Congress. Uh, Diane um, Feinstein from California would not be in Congress. I mean, she transformed our political process. The 1991 Civil Rights Act probably would not have passed at that time without her coming forward. So she's done more for our society than we realize. And not only has she made women, in a sense, feel more empowered and, in fact, be more empowered, but men, in many instances, have changed their behavior because of that. They've been forced to reflect on the kind of insensitive and insane and clearly inappropriate things that they do and say uh, and accept because of that. And I think it also had an impact on the multi-million dollar judgment against a, a law firm recently uh, for sexual harassment and sexual discrimination uh, because the society's attitudes has, have changed about this and therefore I think that she she really was the has become the Rosa Parks of uh, sexual harassment and sex discrimination law and it was a point of departure in the way we see relationships between men uh, and women. And, and I was happy to have a, a small part in making sure that her story was presented to the public in a way uh, that will be forever uh, embedded in our minds and in our history when we think about relations between men and women, uh, between, between uh, women and men uh, in, in this country. Do you feel the confirmation process has become more arduous for presidential nominees since the Thomas hearing? The confirmation process is better and worse. Uh, it's better in the sense that as a result of that experience, members of the Senate will look at information and allegations more seriously. Uh, they will look at them earlier. Uh, there will be no rush to judgment to confirm anybody for anything until all the evidence is in. It's also better in the sense that if there are outrageous allegations uh, that they believe may not be true, they can be handled in a confidential m manner with the uh, nominee without a public hearing, uh, but on, on a record, but without a public hearing. And that happened with Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and with Janet Reno as two examples of people where things were said that weren't true, uh, but they didn't have to fight them out. Uh, uh, and they could exa examine those things. If the same process had been in place with Professor Hill, they could have examined this, uh, the, uh, the 14 men could have examined it, and the fact that they didn't was a sign that the process wasn't fair. And it's a much more open process, a much more thorough and reflective process. And I think that uh, if they had had the procedures then that they have now, uh, Justice Thomas would not have been confirmed. Uh, it seems clear to me they could have done a more thorough job. It's worse in some respects as well because uh, I see people, members of Congress, holding the system hostage, not, not with just judicial nominees but with other nominees. And the Henry Foster nomination is an example of a recent problem. That is that members of Congress, like uh, Senator Dole was saying he was going to, in a sense, try to go along with the filibuster so that the hearing could never get to the Senate. That doesn't make any sense. I mean. If you are a senator, you, you have the obligation to vote. And I don't care how you vote. I don't care if you're for or against. But the process has to move forward. And if you have an objection, take it on the floor and vote on it. That is the worst part of it. That, that, that's a part of these hearings. And the worst of all was, I think, the, and I call it the cowardly act of President Clinton in not allowing Lonnie Guineer to have a hearing. I was a, a, a close friend of hers, an ardent supportive of hers. I hope that she'll be on this faculty uh, at some point in the foreseeable future. 
and uh, she was completely mischaracterized. Her her work was misrepresented. Uh, she was a victim of character assassination, and the president did not have the fortitude to present her case to the Senate for a hearing. He was, in a sense, forced to back down, and that to me was despicable. That's purely because of things outside the record, outside the hearing, and that lost Lonnie Guineer the opportunity to be what I imagine would have been the greatest civil rights uh, leader uh, in uh, the Justice Department ever. Um, and it, 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 it was, I think, uh, uh, one of the low points in the Clinton administration. And so that's the, one of the worst parts, that outside external pressure prevented someone from even getting a hearing. In my sense, that let's air it out either privately or in a public hearing, but let's not eliminate debate by not even having a meaningful hearing. Uh, and that, to me, was a sign that there are still problems uh, in the process. Uh, ultimately, I think it will work itself out. And I think what should happen is that the president should let the members of the Senate know about candidates before they are publicly disclosed so that those differences can be debated and discussed in a way to lead to a meaningful process. Uh, but I believe it, the Bork here was a good example. Reagan didn't back down. He pushed the Bork nomination. Uh, because he believed in Robert Bork, and, and for better or for worse, he was going to let, let it be decided in a public way. Clinton has not done that, uh, and he has not done that on more than one occasion. And that's, that, to me, is the process when politics prevents the process from going forward. And I, I think that we have to fix it so that even controversial candidates will have their day in court, even if they turn out to be unsuccessful days in court, and they ultimately lose nominations. In addition to your other work, you've written several law review articles. What has been the focus of your writing? My, my writing has been broadly focused. It's, it's on constitutional issues generally, uh, criminal justice issues more specifically. I've written about uh, Miranda, that is, uh, to how, how, to what extent should the law give uh, criminal defendants the right to remain silent and have a lawyer present before they're questioned by police. Uh, I've written about race in uh, sentencing, about whether uh, race and religion in sentencing, whether people's religious views uh, should be protected, uh, about whether uh, Reverend Sun Young Moon was fairly tried, and I don't agree with his religious views, but I do agree that, that he should not be prosecuted because of his religion. Uh, and I wrote an article about that, that the, the prosecutors were able to prevent him from uh, certain legal opportunities because they um, in, insisted that he go to trial in front of a jury and many of the jurors who tried him uh, thought that he was uh, uh, into brainwashing and mind altering practices that he was a wacko and I think that influenced his conviction uh, in New York uh, and he wanted to go to a trial without with just a judge and not with the jury and I thought that his religion became mixed up in the criminal justice system and, and he had to pay a cost that led him to be prosecuted. Um, I've also written about uh, the motivations for becoming public defenders and, and what would justify people doing the work uh, and sustaining the work. I've written more recently about Cesar Chavez and, and his role as a role model in the struggle for civil rights and, and how he, in a sense, has been lost uh, uh, in the international circles as being an international leader. I, th I think he's of the same level as uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and yet he has not been recognized because people saw him in too narrow a concept as someone who was boycotting grapes, but he really was an adherent of civil disobedience uh, for decades and sacrificed much uh, not to just promote farm workers, but a whole host of issues that were important to our, our nation and our world. And I've also written about what we call peremptory challenges, that is the, the lawyer's use uh, uh, of practice of striking jurors uh, without giving reasons and arguing that that, that system needs to be really re-examined. Uh, I'm now working on a book about my experiences as a public defender and also a, a separate book about public service, uh, how you can do well and do good. It's kind of a call to public service for young lawyers saying that um, 
they should not be discouraged uh, or detoured uh, in law school uh, in pursuing those interests that bring them to law school. Most students come to law school committed to the public interest. By the time they leave, they're, they have such enormous debt that they say they, they, they have no justification but to go into uh, a corporate practice to pay their debts. And so I'm trying to almost a call to arms, but a call to public service for uh, young uh, law students uh, is, is where my writing uh, is heading now. And I'm also writing about the South African Constitution and the, the, the right to I indigents there to receive a lawyer the same way that we give all indigents here uh, who are charged with a crime the right to a lawyer. So my writing is a reflection of my experience, my practice, uh, common sense, uh, and kind of challenges to the prevailing notions of the legal system. Uh, so I'm always pushing to critically examine what we know to be the system today in asking for uh, new perspectives on the legal system. Speaking of the South, South Africa's new constitution, what has been your involvement with that? I uh, visited South Africa four times. I'm going back again uh, this fall. And uh, I've uh, been pushing for uh, and supporting a constitution that uh, recognizes many of the rights that we have in our constitution, but also avoid some of the shortcomings of, of our constitution. Uh, and specifically, uh, the right to counsel is one that I'm pushing. And I, I, I just published an article on it about uh, that if South Africa is ever going to be viewed as a legitimate nation, that they have to uh, respect the most basic fundamental rights of its citizens. And if we have, in effect, eliminated apartheid uh, as a matter of law, we also have to eliminate it as a matter of practice. And the same issues I raise in my writing here, that is that if people see a system where the police, the judges, the lawyers, and the jurors are all white and the defendants are all black, um, that there's going to be a perception of the system's not fair. That's particularly in South Africa, where the majority is black, and if the police are white, and the prosecutors are white, and the judges are white, even though you say apartheid's ended, uh, people are going to say there's something wrong with this picture. The system really hasn't been transformed. So I have urged the South African government in the process of modifying and revising the Constitution to make sure that the poorest citizens who face uh, loss of where people are powerless and where you're going to take away their liberty, that they should at least have a lawyer there challenging the state. The fact that it's a black state makes no difference if people will have their liberty taken without due process and without a fair trial. So I have been fighting for that and pushing for that. And uh, as a result of uh, the, my first visit in 1990 uh, and, and given a, a keynote speech at a conference in uh, Johannesburg about the need for a public defender system and the right to counsel, uh, the South African government in the apartheid system did create a public defender system. And now I'm trying to get the post-apartheid Mandela government to take that further and create a na national system uh, allowing indigents the right to, to lawyers uh, with certain charges and at least some kind of legal representation with other charges if it's not a lawyer, uh, a law student, a paralegal, or some kind of legal advisor to say the system will only be as legitimate as it treats its poorest and least powerful citizens. And that's uh, a direction where my work is going from just national issues to international issues. As a guest commentator on several news programs, what issues have you addressed and what has been your stance on those issues? Well, uh, uh, I've um, been on every program from who should be nominated to the Supreme Court to what, what's the support for affirmative action. Uh, to issues about the death penalty, to concerns about the Rodney King trial. I mean, I've talked about a whole host of issues. And my stance has always been that people deserve uh, fairness and equality in our system. Uh, and that diversity is a strength, affirmative action is important. Uh, I, I guess you would basically, if you had to categorize, my thinking is left-leaning liberal, uh, uh, or at least pragmatist and moderate on, on other issues. Um, and uh, I don't try to speak for the race or for the nation. I just take my views and, and express them based on my experience and my training and my writing. 
uh, and I'm willing to debate them anywhere, anytime with anybody. Uh, and uh, I try not to be compromising in terms of not telling people what they think is okay, but telling them what I believe to be right, and they can agree or disagree, but I'm going to state them as clearly as I can. As a moderator from, pro from programs ranging from ethics to racism to violence, what programs did you enjoy doing the most, and what do you feel is the societal benefit of these programs? It's interesting. I think the most interesting work that I, I've done, and I've done a lot of television programs and a lot of uh, round tables, the most interesting, interesting enough, uh, was the most successful. It was a program on military ethics, which had nothing to do with criminal justice necessarily, or race, or crime. But it was grappling with issues of how do we train people to know the difference between um, um, defending our liberty um, and breaking the law. How do we follow orders? It was about military ethics, but it was really about societal values and personal ethics and autonomy and legitimacy and a host of other topics. But uh, should a, for example, should a commander who knows that his uh, battalion of uh, soldiers will be ambushed in the interest of protecting his country and winning a battle, should he let the men know, we're, we're the sacrificial lambs, the men and women know? That's a hard ethical question. If you let them know, they probably won't go in to be sacrificed. And if you don't let them know, it'll help your country and maybe win the war, but, you know, 50 people may lose their lives. Uh, or a journalist uh, in this program who uh, has this great story, he's able to interview the enemy. And what happens if he knows that the enemy's going to attack U.S. soldiers? Is his obligation to cover the story uh, uh, and report it to go back and say the enemy killed American soldiers? Or should he try to alert the American soldiers, which means he'll probably lose his life uh, and maybe save the American soldiers, but the story will never be reported? And those are hard choices. Is he, is he an American or is she an American or is she a reporter first? How do you make those choices? And what happens when you have a soldier who's scared? Uh, do you physically force them to go into battle? And if they don't, are you willing to take their lives? What happens when you have a hostage who just killed 10 of your, your soldiers? Do you take that hostage's life uh, or do you, do you save them because there are certain rules of engagement for prisoners of war? A whole host of qu questions that we think are about war but they're also about every aspect of our lives, our being, our autonomy, our decision-making process. Um, and that was the best and most interesting program that I've ever done. And even though it was done about eight years ago, no matter where I go in the country, people remember it and want to tell me stories and recount some of the things that uh, they remember about it, and it's still aired occasionally. These programs are shown over and over and over around the country. Uh, and that, to me, is the most memorable one that I've done. Um, the other ones that I found uh, almost as compelling, and I think have an uh, important aspect, are talking about children and ethics issues and how children make ethical choices about lying, about cheating, about bigotry, uh, about um, charity, I mean, issues like that, how do we teach values to our children, and, and, and whether our values in some respects are, are, are in conflict. Well, do we tell our children, do as I say and not as I do? Do we give contradictory messages sometime? And that has been, uh, to me, some of the more interesting programs I've done uh, on uh, television, uh, as well as a series on uh, uh, surviving the odds and the violence special dealing with issues of black and particularly black men in the justice system. What, what do we know about it? What are we doing about it? How do we change it? How do we fix it? Uh, those have been interesting programs. As a commentator for NBC Nightly News on the O.J. Simpson murder trial, what is your opinion of how Judge Ito has handled the trial? Uh, I think Judge Ito uh, is a very smart judge. He's a very thoughtful judge, a uh, very reflective judge. Uh, I think that uh, while I would give him, in general, high marks as a judge and as an intellectual, I would give him very low marks for this trial. Uh, he let the lawyers uh, run the courthouse. Uh, they spent months on issues that should have taken minutes. Uh, the case has been an excruciating uh, uh, and painful uh, uh, process that has been unfair to the lawyers to the victims, to the jurors, and to the justice system in general. 
Uh, and now he's, he's adding insult to injury by trying to accelerate the process and doing it at a time when the government's pre presenting its most crucial evidence. Now he wants to stop the lawyers, to stop redundancy, to stop speaking objections. And the government is presenting some very crucial but boring evidence. And if he rushes through this DNA evidence, it may in some sense compromise their ability to obtain a conviction. Uh, I am convinced that they won't get a conviction in the case anyway. Uh, and it's not because of uh, uh, what some think are racial animosity or the juries divide along, along race. I don't believe that. I just know that's not the case. I think the jury may acquit because this is a case where the government does not have a confession from O.J. Simpson. Uh, they have a person that's a very powerful character uh, because unlike most criminal defendants, he is known. He's not a stranger. And that character will carry some. They don't have the murder weapon or weapons involved. They don't have an eyewitness. Uh, and they do have a lot of police sloppiness. Uh, they have some questionable conduct. And that even though it's a circumstantial evidence case, even though the jury could say, I think it might be O.J. Simpson, I'm not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. Which means they can say, yeah, it, it probably was him. It could have been him. It might have been him. I have this sense that it's him. But that's not how you make a decision in a case of this magnitude. They have to say, do you have an abiding conviction? Am I certain? Do I have a level of certainty and confidence that every single day I can walk around and say, I'm convinced of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And I won't say, oh, but he didn't confess. Oh, but there's no eyewitness. Oh, but they never found a weapon. Oh, but they didn't have, find blood in places where there should have been blood. Oh, but they didn't explain to me what these other four men were doing there. Or they didn't explain this inconsistent finding in the blood evidence. I mean, there's enough there that I think that the jury will, could acquit, uh, or certainly at, at least uh, there will be a hung jury with, with a majority voting for uh, an acquittal uh, in the case. So th that's my sense of uh, what will happen in my sense as well as uh, Judge Edel's kind of um, unfortunate handling of the case. I think if it was retried, he'd handle it very differently. What is your opinion of the media coverage of the trial and of legal cases in general? Well, the, 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 I think that's, that's pretty pure and simple. I, I think the it, me, media coverage of it has been excessive, uh, inaccurate, uh, and unfortunate. Uh, I don't think that the camera should be in the courtroom. I think that's a huge problem. I, uh, even though I'm in, a commentator for NBC News, and I said that on NBC News, I thought they would fire me. You know, they loved it. They just gave more publicity to news. But I thought that, I think that the cameras changed the quality and nature of the, the trial. Uh, lawyers and the judge are responding to the media and not to the evidence. Uh, people are dressing and speaking and performing in certain ways because of the camera, uh, defense and prosecution. And all the lawyers are competent. Uh, Marsha Clark, uh, you know, uh, Darden, uh, Cochran, Shapiro, uh, Bailey, uh, Barishek, uh, you know, all the lawyers are very competent and very skillful. And in some sense, their performance every day is being micromanaged by this, this endless list of commentators. But I, I think the problem is that the camera in the courtroom has changed the nature of the, 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 the case. And it's the only case that you know of where people can watch it and become witnesses. This case can go on uh, forever because we've had a number of people who watch something on TV and then they became witnesses in the case, you know, and that's absurd. Uh, the television has changed so that anybody who disagrees with something or saw something or heard something different can come in now and I think that has uh, made it a very unfair system uh, and I think that uh, since there won't be a conviction, there's not going to be any legal precedent, but I think there'll be a host, if, there is, if he's acquitted, I think the cameras have changed it because people have watched it and they're going to, politicians are going to try all kinds of ways to change the justice system by modifying what can go on in a courtroom, and that's what worries me as well. That it's going to be harder for not OJ, but the AJs, the BJs, uh, and the CJs around the country to get a fair trials because of OJ. That people are going to say the justice system is in complete disarray, and it's going to revert back uh, in ways that are going to hurt poor uh, defendants who are going to be tried. And that's what worries me the most. What other memorable cases have you been involved with um, while you've been 
at Harvard and even before the school? Well, there are a lot of interesting cases, uh, and I won't talk about the details, but I've had some great clients. I represented Randall Robinson and others in Washington, D.C. when we had the first protest against uh, apartheid in South Africa. I uh, was helping to arrange to get the cases dismissed each, dismissed each day when they would go to the South African Embassy, and literally thousands of people were arrested and had all the charges dismissed, and uh, Representative Randall Robinson and others when they were actually arrested at Shell Oil Company in Washington. So that was the first opportunity to get involved in a, in a very active political case. I represented John Gotti on appeal when he was prosecuted in New York. Uh, Al Krieger was his trial lawyer. And he comes to Harvard every year and volunteers a week with my students to train them to be trial lawyers. And he asked me to, to work on the trial, which I couldn't, uh, but he asked me to work on the appeal, which I did, uh, because I was very concerned and still concerned about the government's ability to try John Gotti in a way that they've never tried anybody else with an anonymous sequestered jury uh, and allowing the government to use this guy, Semi the Bull Gravano, as a witness. Uh, who could talk about that he committed 19 murders, but not let the lawyers ask him in detail about those 19 murders to see whether or not he's a truthful witness. And that they allowed expert testimony uh, uh, by uh, an FBI agent about how the mafia operates, even though this guy, in my judgment, didn't qualify as an expert. And the worst uh, aspect of the case, uh, uh, at least in my judgment, is that the government had the power to disqualify John Gotti's lawyer, Bruce Cutler, uh, claiming that they might use him as a witness. And they never intended to use him as a witness. So to me, you know, I'm, I'm not a John Gotti fan or saying that he's innocent or, or should be in the community. I am a firm believer in that the Constitution applies to John Gotti as it does to every other Jane Doe and John Doe in the country. And that I was perturbed by the way that he was treated. Uh, and that I think that when we make, when we change our law to get one person, it's unfair. The same way I worry about Timothy McVeigh. Uh, if he is in fact guilty of this crime uh, and the government can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, he should be tried and punished. Uh, but I think that he has a right to a fair trial. I also represent Tupac Shakur, the uh, rap artist who is now on trial, uh, who's been convicted. I represent him on appeal uh, uh, in his conviction. Um, uh, in the New York criminal courts, and I uh, uh, also uh, represent um, Dorothy West, uh, who is, like I said, my favorite client. She's the last living member of the Harvard, Harlem Renaissance, a 95-year-old black woman who lives on uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard and who's written about the experience, the black experience in the vineyard in the 30s and 40s and more recently. And that, too, has turned out to be a, a magnificent experience uh, representing uh, her uh, on this case. So those cases uh, have been quite uh, rewarding. I also represented Desiree Washington uh, in her uh, uh, civil lawsuit against uh, Mike Tyson, and that has been uh, settled recently um, uh, to her satisfaction. Uh, so it, it's, it, there's been some great uh, opportunities to represent people like that, but there are also thousands of people at this law school, in this community, and other places uh, who are represented. And the great thing about it is that their names never appeared in the paper. They were never in the press. And they're very happy with the resolution. And they didn't have any money to pay for their cases. And they shouldn't have to pay for them. And so that's the principle, too, that you can do good uh, without having to uh, financially benefit from it. And this, I tell my students that, that they say, how can you be a public defender and do all these things? And how, how are you going to ever pay your bills? And in time, uh, things happen. They happen in a very positive way and in a way that I'm very satisfied. And so it's been a very satisfying career uh, for me. And uh, uh, if I've accomplished this much at age 42, I can uh, hopefully slow down and, and not feel that I have to spend another 40 years at the same pace uh, doing the same things, but can now concentrate my effort on my two major issues trying to make sure that South Africa becomes a true and free and full democracy and trying to turn around the issue of youth violence and particularly dealing with some ways to uh, prevent the incredible influx of African American males into our justice system to figure out a way to turn that around. If I can spend the rest of my years uh, as a lawyer trying to change those two things and have some impact there, it will be a very, very satisfying legal career. Are there any lawyers
players and judges that have influenced and inspired your career? There are a lot. Uh, some known and some unknown. Uh, Judge Thurgood Marshall. I mean, he was my role model and is my role model uh, because he's accomplished so much in his life and, and meant, meant so much. And I had the chance to interview him uh, shortly before his death. Uh, and he paid me the highest compliment saying that uh, I'm allowing you to interview me because uh, I know about you and uh, people say good things about you and that's why you're going to get the interview. Uh, also people who are not as well known, Charles Hamilton Houston who was probably the greatest African American lawyer ever who defeated Jim Crow in our society, who trained Thurgood Marshall and legions of other black warriors uh, as social engineers as he called it, that you're either a social engineer or a parasite and he said that you're either doing something for the community or against the community. And he was very important uh, to me uh, as well. Judge Leon Higginbotham, who was a, a great lawyer and a great uh, 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 advocate and, and who now is a great teacher as well. Um, Constance Baker Motley, who was on the Second Circuit, uh, who was on the D Southern District of New York, who was a wonderful judge and also was very active in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and has done phenomenal work, was a real role model. Uh, Margaret Burnham, who I saw uh, represent Angela Davis when she was just out of law school and who I've tried cases with here in Massachusetts has been an incredible uh, role model uh, uh, for me as well. Professor Anita Hill, uh, because of her ability to stand up for her convictions uh, and to talk forcefully about the things uh, that are important to her uh, and, and that make a huge difference. Uh, in, in her life, uh, and um, uh, you know, there have been uh, one of my greatest role models uh, recently passed, and that's Ken Mundy, uh, just a brilliant lawyer who I adored watching in Washington D.C. He represented Mary Marion Barry in his trial and had, uh, and, and uh, he was only convicted of a misdemeanor and acquitted of a number of other charges uh, or uh, hung jury on others. He was representing uh, Congressman Dan Rost Rostenkowski at the time of his death. He represented a young man named Terrence Johnson, charged with two homicides in Maryland, had him acquitted of one and convicted of uh, manslaughter on the other, and, and had innumerable, innumerable acquittals. And uh, he just would never say no to anything. And so uh, I kind of follow his path in this direction. Uh, Gary Bellow, who's on this faculty, who was a public defender and created a uh, the Civil Legal Services Program here at the Legal Services Center and has done a phenomenal job here at this school uh, has also been uh, a very important role model. And Derek Bell, as I said before, who as a teacher, as an advocate, uh, as a lawyer, as a scholar, uh, has been the kind of role model that, that I uh, follow with uh, great enthusiasm and great commitment uh, uh, and has made a huge difference in my life. Those are uh, some of the people who meant the most to me uh, and, and as, as a lawyer, and uh, lawyers and as judges. You're one of the younger commentators in our program. If we came back 20 years from now, what are some of the things you'd probably speak about that have happened between the, in the next 20 years? I would say that uh, my optimism uh, was uh, fulfilled, uh, that um, as much as I thought it was not possible, uh, there uh, was uh, African American uh, and a woman in the White House uh, and that uh, it no longer became uh, an issue about qualifications or, or character, uh, that uh, Congress was representative, uh, that we, we didn't have Democrats and, and Republicans or liberals and conservatives, but we had a much more uh, moderate and consensus form of government and it was much more reflective of America and it looked like America. That uh, as we see in 1995 that African Americans have stopped smoking, uh, teenagers, uh, in dramatic fashion from 23 percent to like 4 percent and uh, that in the year 2015 uh, that we don't have crack or any other kind of a, a drug that's cheap uh, and effective and that's in a sense uh, uh, imprisoning the community that people have turned away from drugs uh, and that we see an alarming number of African Americans going to college uh, so much so that, uh, that they're bursting out the, 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 the seams um, um, and that uh, my daughter who claims that she's uh, going to be a lawyer 
uh, has just told me that uh, her name will be the lead name in our law firm uh, and that uh, the second Ogle tree is me, uh, that, that, that she's the uh, 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 managing partner uh, in the firm uh, and that uh, she's trying to push me to become a senior partner uh, and, and, and uh, uh, retire from the practice. Uh, and that um, uh, that we really are a global community and, and that not only uh, uh, the, is South Africa successful, but it's the model that other nations are using South Africa as a way to have a non-racial form of government and that um, the next generations of leaders in South Africa have really been able to show us how with a black majority there, there are minority rights that are important that are protected. Uh, and that people uh, are get along uh, in, in important ways. Um, and uh, that uh, I will uh, have my uh, charter fishing business somewhere on the East Coast uh, uh, and will be the captain uh, of, of my ship uh, and uh, will be spending as much time at sea as I do at, on land. Uh, and I will still get my slip opinions and cases and occasionally write an article and give a speech. Uh, but we'll have a very different kind of life uh, 20 years from now. One last question. Looking back on your life and your career, what accomplishments are you most proud of? My children. Um, uh, I, I wish I had been uh, and could be uh, a better husband uh, and a better father uh, and even better uh, sibling with my brothers. I think that the people who have suffered the most from my success are those who are the closest to me. Uh, because the kind of work I do and the intensity I put into my work uh, obviously has an impact on the people I care about the most. Uh, and uh, my wife is incredibly uh, resilient. Uh, if, if I were Pam, I would have left me 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm the most fortunate man in the world to have her uh, there by my side as she has been since we met in college uh, uh, more than 24 years ago. Uh, my kids uh, are rem re remarkably resilient and strong and smart and articulate and they have not let the fact that they are middle class interfere with their perspective. Uh, as much as my wife and I felt that we were groundbreakers by going as the first in our family to college uh, and going to schools like Stanford and Harvard, um, our kids uh, have no interest in those schools and are very much focused on historically black colleges because they can get a good education and because race is irrelevant and they don't have to look over their shoulder or someone will question whether their affirmative action admits or how they got in. Uh, they can be brilliant and not have to ever reflect on race. And that doesn't make the president of Harvard or Stanford very happy. They both have been upset that my son uh, expressed no interest in going where I went. And uh, you know, who wants to live under your father's shadow? Uh, and my daughter uh, has, at least for the moment, placated me and my wife by saying that she'll, she's interested in Stanford. Uh, but she's also interested in African studies and Asian studies because she went to Japan uh, after her sophomore year in, in high school. And so she much, has much more of a world view at age 15 than it took me uh, until age 35 to even think about. And so that, that is the great part of life that my family has made it and despite my lack of um, time, commitment, and focus that when I've been trying to change the world, uh, they have been there as a foundation, uh, uh, keeping things in order and moving things forward. And so uh, I'm happy for them, uh, I'm proudest of them, and that they respect and appreciate what I do. Uh, you know, when my son comes to hear me give my speeches uh, or uh, when, he, when he wrote uh, in one of his college applications that uh, uh, he was, I was one of his heroes because I helped another friend of his uh, live with us and go into college. That to me is worth more than a thousand conversations and, and a thousand successes. When my daughter came to me and told me that um, after the first day of the hearings when I felt that we were just overwhelmed that uh, she believed it needed to heal uh, and uh, how important that was to me that, that she validated my involvement. Uh, that was uh, important uh, to me. Uh, and when my wife stood with me uh, in the protest uh, against South Africa, uh, when, when she stood with me when we served as guidance, uh, a committee to re 
write the guidance counselor rules at the high school uh, when she was there, uh, when I argued the Gotti case, uh, even though she was not a John Gotti fan, she's a strong believer in uh, constitutional principles. Um, she's always been there, and so those are the accomplishments. It's, n it's not the, my degrees, it's not my awards, it's not television, it's not my professorship at Harvard Law School. It's a family and a community of people who say, we are proud of you, but we believe in what you do. Uh, and we're behind you. Uh, that's what's made it uh, worthwhile. Thank you very much for your commentary today. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure doing it.